Good morning, Bayside. Good morning, Bayside. There we go. There you are. You're here. Would you stand up this morning as we just worship our God? Would you pray with me as we just uh, kind of start our morning off? God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for who you are in our lives. And God, regardless of the things going on in our lives, God, we say, yes, I will praise you in the midst of a storm. Yes, I'll lift you up when things aren't, aren't going well or that are tough. God, I'll continue to praise you in the midst. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. Will not fail me now. same God who's never made, working all things out, working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the way. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I choose to pray to glorify, glorify. the drill because none of you sat down. That's awesome. Before you do, greet somebody and give them that good warm Bayside welcome this morning. And here's a novel idea. Say hello to somebody you've never met before. Uh, thanks for worshiping with us this morning. We've got a great morning going on already, a great start. We're going to be sharing communion together in a minute. But before we get there, just let me bring a couple things to your attention. If you are new with us and you have never filled out a contact card, you'd like to get a little bit more information about our church. There are cards in the chair behind, in front of you or behind you or around you, wherever you can find one. Fill that out for us. Give us your email. Put it in the offering bucket when it goes by, and we'll get you more information about our church. We'd also like to pray for you. If you have a prayer request, something that we can pray, we'd love to pray for our people. We have an amazing prayer team. Put that prayer request on that contact card. Put it in the offering bucket, or there's a bucket in the back on your way out. You can drop it in there as well. Uh, and praises. We love to hear about praises. We love to hear about what God's doing in the hearts and lives of our people. 
and we can just give, give him thanks and, and see him glorified through what's going on in your heart and life. And uh, also, if you um, are want to know more information about anything that's going on in the bulletin, everything is in the bulletin, or at least almost everything, and there's inserts in there. This is a busy time of year. we got very a busy. whole lot going very, on. Very busy. Not to mention that Easter is only like a month away. Can you believe that? We are really excited about what God's going to do in us and through us. You'll be seeing the banners go up around town and out in front, but we need wrapped candy because we have a few kids that like to do Easter egg hunts. A few. A ton, yeah. So we need a ton of candy. So if you could start bringing those in, we'd appreciate it. Uh, either in the eggs already, or if not, just bring the candy in and we'll put them in eggs. The rockers take that on as kind of a little project to stuff those eggs and have them ready to go. Men's and women's groups, we still got the wild at heart and captivating going on. It's just getting started. I know from what I've heard from the ladies that it's just been amazing, and I've been part of the men's, and it's been amazing. If you haven't been part of it, come and join us. Men, tonight, 6 o'clock at the Hoffman's. The address is in the bulletin. Come and just join us. It's not, it's not all about, you know, huggy body and all that stuff, okay? It's not like that. This is just guys being guys. And I know the ladies do the same thing in their study, but it's amazing to see what God created us as men to do with the, with the masculinity that he created us with and the ladies with the feminicity? Is that a word? Anyway, you get the picture. It's what God created us to be and how he created us and realizing that and realizing the potential we have with the God and through the God that created us. So come and be part of that. Also coming up, we have our pasta dinner fundraiser for our kids camp. As I've been saying, as we... Last year, we subsidized our kids 100% to go to camp. We're planning on doing that again this year. This is a big part of it. We just come. We hang out. The pasta is going to be provided. There is a, a nominal cost to you. Don't let that stop you, folks. If for some reason you can't, just let us know. We're all good for that. But if you can, come and, and uh, help subsidize our kids to go to camp. We need raffle baskets, and we need giveaways. And there will probably be, I don't know, 40 or 50 raffle baskets up here. There will be... Uh, silent auction items going on at the same time. It's a lot of fun. So come and be part of that. Again, the information's in your bulletin. There are sign-up sheets in the back. So if you can sign up so we know kind of to plan how many are coming and who can, uh, who can bring a raffle basket. And it can be anything. It can be we've had, we've had sand toys to fishing trips to beauty stuff. I mean, every, you name like it. Like a new car. I don't think we've had one of those, but it'd be fun. <laughs> That was donated to the pastor, from what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, come and be part of that. Also, start thinking about our yard sale, which is also a fundraiser for camp. It's going to be the end of April, a little more than a month away. And it, you know how fast this goes, folks. So we don't want junk, but you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure, so to speak. <laughs> we want sellable items. We're going to start collecting those. You'll start hearing more about it. So start thinking about hanging on to that stuff before you give it away or before you, you know, get rid of it or whatever. So we want to, it's a big deal, folks. We open it up to the community and people come and be part of that. And then let's see, last but not, oh, next Sunday we have Life Scan. If you have any interest whatsoever in helping us out in any aspect of kids' ministry, from breakaway to trunk or treat to kids' ministry itself, or being any part of that, or if you just want to be on record as being live scanned. Next Sunday, we are providing that for you to be live scanned, okay? So be part of that. There's also a sign up back there in our amazing information center. Get your names on there so we kind of know how to plan. The church is paying for that, so you don't have to, but that's a big deal, okay? Especially in the day and age in which we live, we need to make sure that everybody that we have that's involved in any kind of leadership or or teaching or kids ministry or anything is life scanned okay so be part of that we're giving you that opportunity last but not least i want to bring, just bring something to your attention last sunday we heard from mark tyler from 360 serve an amazing ministry folks there was a there was a, a study put out by francis chan called multiplier i don't know some of us some of you have gone through that we've gone through it as a church but the whole concept of multiplication of what one man can do in planting churches in a place like Tanzania and China. It's just exploding, and we are part of that. We're subsidizing two pastors for $100 a month. That's right, $50 each supports a pastor and his family. We, 
whenever we have a guest speaker, we, we give them a little bit of a stipend for coming in and sharing with us. Well, he requested that we give the 360 serve, that we give his stipend to 360 serve, not to he and his wife. That is going to be applied to our pastor in Tanzania for a motorcycle. You saw some of that stuff <laughs> up there, right? Yeah, so here's the deal. $2,000 buys this pastor a motorcycle, which will give him much more mobility in going around and, and planting churches that is, is what he's doing, his ministry. So you're going to be hearing more about that. We're going to meet as a leadership team this week, and we're going to come up with some ideas on how to do that. $2,000 for us is a drop in the bucket. This is reaching wide and unleashing compassion like nobody's business. There are some brochures back there in the back table for 360 Serve. You can get on their mailing list, and you can get information from them that they send out weekly about what's going on in their ministry, through their ministry, how God is reaching people, and how God is saving people, and people are being baptized by the hundreds of thousands in these third world countries and, and bigger countries other than, than the country that we live in. But the impact that we're having on that is amazing. So grab one of these little brochures back there on the back table. It's got information on there, how you can sign up for that. If you want to support a pastor yourself as a family, as a women's group, as a men's group, as a whatever group, if you would like to do that, $50 a month supports a pastor in one of these countries. You can do that as well, and you can get that information as well at 360serve.org. So I encourage you, take a look at it. Doesn't mean you gotta sign up, but just check it out. It's an amazing concept in, in missions and how God is just doing some amazing things overseas, and we are part of that. I'm really excited about that. And I'm really excited to hear from our pastors about what God is doing in them and through them because of your generosity. That is reaching wide. That is unleashing compassion, and I thank you. So with that said, whew, lots going on, like I said, but let's get ready. Let's just check our baggage at the door, folks. Let's just open our hearts to worship this morning. Can we go ahead and have our ushers come on forward, and let's pray together. Father God, this morning we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are God of all creation. You are the Lord of lords and King of kings, that this is your world, that there's nothing in this world that can keep us away from you. And so, this Father, this morning we run to you. We run to your open arms. We just pray that you will lift us up and that you will encourage us, that you will just gladden our hearts, Father, and just help us to leave the stuff the, the, that we deal with on a daily basis as humans, leave it with you and just let you wrap us in your arms and just love us and just give us the courage and the strength to love you back the way you created us to do. In your name we pray, amen. Well, this morning we have the opportunity to take communion in a little bit. So these next songs, I would challenge you just to let this be kind of a time to get your heart right before we take communion this morning. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. So
What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Let me grab a seat just for a moment. As we come before the Lord's table this morning together as a family, Reading from Psalm 103, it says this, Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases and redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like eagles. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. So far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's what we're celebrating this morning. We come before a mighty and holy God, before the throne of his grace, pure and blameless in his sight because of the sacrifice that Jesus gave for our sins. God's great love so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. This is a time where we come together as a family, as a church family, and just share together at the Lord's Supper, just symbolism, symbolizing what Jesus did on the cross for us. This is a time of, of restoration. It's a time of looking within ourselves and asking ourselves, what is it within our hearts and within our lives that is holding us back from having that awesome relationship with God that he wants us to have. He doesn't run from us. We run from him. His arms are always open wide, waiting for us to run to him. We have that choice. And this morning, I offer you that choice to run to him as a few minutes as we share together that you just take a few minutes to contemplate what Jesus did on the cross, the great love of God that he sent Jesus to die for us. It's a time of rejoicing. It's a time of, of just remembering what Jesus did for us. And you know the story when Jesus was with his disciples just before his, his crucifixion, the last time he had to share together with his disciples. And as they sat together in that upper room, and Jesus had just given an amazing example of humility by washing his disciples' feet. And as they sat there together, he took the bread, and the Bible tells us that he broke the bread, and he passed it around to his disciples around that table. And he said, take and eat this bread. This is a symbol of my body that is going to be broken for you. And we know that that was the fact, didn't, don't we? And then he took the juice, he took the wine, he took the drink, and he blessed it, and he passed it around to his disciples. And he said, take this wine, drink it as a symbol of my blood that is going to be shed for you. And they shared that together as a family. And later in Corinthians, Paul commanded the church and taught the church, and he said, I received from God this message that we are to do this as a church body, often in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. And that's why we're here this morning. That's why we do this. We have two stations set up in the back. Just when you're ready, after you've had a chance to just, just let God speak into your heart and into your soul for a minute, just make your way back, take a piece of bread, take a cup of juice, and return to your chair. It's, it's gluten-free bread so that nobody can, is, is um, not counted because of their food allergies. So we just offer that to you. It's all gluten-free. Just take the bread, take the, the juice, return to your seat. And when you're ready, on your own, between you and God, just go ahead and eat the bread, drink the cup, and just remember the symbolism of what that represents this morning. We're going to have some of the prayer team in the back back there. I'll be back there if you would like someone to pray for you for anything specific or just to pray for you in general. Just come back and hook up with us and we would be more than happy. We would love to pray for you 
at this time. We encourage anyone, this is open, this is not something that's just for church family, this is anyone who has received Christ into their hearts to join us in this. This is a, the, the global community of Christ that we celebrate this. And we encourage you as families for your kids to participate in this as long as you talk to them and as long as they understand the meaning and the importance of this. We don't take this lightly. So with that said, we're going to go ahead and ask the blessing on the bread and the cup, and then the, the worship team is going to continue to lead us in worship this morning. But just use this as an opportunity to let God speak into your hearts, speak into your lives, that he is greater than anything this world can throw at us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Would you let's pray together. Father God, we just ask your blessing on this time together as we share the symbolism of what you did for us by sending your son, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for giving it all up. Seated at the right hand of God, came down and lived and died a brutal death so that we could have a perfect sacrifice for our sins. We thank you for that this morning. We worship you. Father, we ask your blessing on this bread as we share together, symbolizing the body of Jesus that was broken for us on the cross. We ask your blessing on the cup as it symbolizes the blood that was shed for our sins, to cover our sins, so that we can come before you, pure and blameless in your sight. We love you. We worship you. We see you glorified this morning, Father, in our hearts, and in our lives, in this place, in this community. Father, we just love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Because of Jesus, we have a living hope. Amen. Because of Jesus, we have forgiveness and we have grace. Because of Jesus, we can climb the mountain or cross the chasm because of Jesus. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name. Amen. 
worship you. Because of you, we have a living hope. Because of you, we have grace. Because of you, we have forgiveness. Because of you, we can face tomorrow. Because of you, we can face today. And God, we're thankful for that, for the sacrifice that you made for each and every one of us in this room, that we may be your children of God. We just thank you for the sacrifice that you made on that cross, that each one of us can live with you forever. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids, you may be dismissed. Kids, have fun. Yay. <laughs> oh, what a great, rich start to the morning. Amen. Anytime we can come together around the Lord's table, it's amazing. Anytime we gather together on Sunday, it's amazing. So thanks for worshiping with us this morning. For those of you who attend regularly and our members know, what our core values are, right? What are they? Reach wide, teach deep, and unleash compassion, right? We do these really well, but we can always do better, right? So for those of you who don't know, uh, back in around Christmas time, one of the outreach projects that we, that we did as a church was to have a toy drive for the Alliance Defending Kids. Am I saying that right? Defending the cause of kids and families. That's what I said. <laughs> Heidi is the director of that, among many other hats that she wears. She's family. She's spoken here before. We all know her. And so I'm going to invite her to come up. But I just got to share something. When Just your generosity. When we did this toy drive, we, we had toys stacked everywhere. And I loaded up my pickup truck, and I took them out to their office, which was on a second-floor office. And... Here comes Heidi down with a little beach wagon about yay big. And I said, Heidi, how many trips are we going to take with this beach wagon to get them up there, right? And so your generosity, the way we have blessed their ministry has just been amazing. And their ministry is far reaching. And she's going to come up and share with us this morning from her heart this morning. So would you give Heidi a really warm welcome back to Bayside. Good morning. It's so good to be back here. And you said, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. You said you guys can do better on that. Unleashing compassion. You guys unleash compassion in crazy ways. Just walking in here this morning and seeing everything set up in the back, the bottles that you have, all the different drives that you are doing, um, the garage sale coming up, 
you guys are all over the place in this community, Unleashing Compassion, be far beyond what you guys are doing with us. So I love what you're doing with the pastors, how you are mobilizing pastors in other regions. That's so significant. So thank you for all you're doing in the kingdom. It's kingdom work, right? Like we're all one kingdom, and we're here to, to, to unleash the kingdom um, of light in a dark world. And so thank you for what you're doing. Yeah, we took a lot of loads <laughs> in that little wagon up to, actually I have some pictures. If we can, I think the slides are, or they're about to come up, but I have some pictures for you guys, but thank you for your continued partnership and generosity. It has been such a gift and such a blessing and so, so awesome to be able to call you guys family and to be able to be back here consistently. Um, if you look, I think the next one, there we go. So overall, there's a lot of different churches, organizations, um, community members serving together for kids and families, and there was over 3,000 toys donated. A large portion of that came from you guys. The truck was seriously packed to the rim. It filled up an entire conference room. I have a picture of the conference room um, for you guys. $9,000 came in of gift cards for um, at-risk families who need food, like just needing food for the holidays, and then 52 gift baskets that went for foster adoptive families who just really need to be seen and loved on, um, who, don't feel, who don't feel that regularly and who need support. So if we go to the next slide here, yes. That picture, can you see? That is just like part of the room because I couldn't get the full picture. But there's Pastor Tim and just toys on toys. And underneath those table, toys. More toys, boxes of toys. So thank you guys. And this is ICA. Oh yeah, if you could play that one again. Um, this is ICA. So this is one of my favorite stories. They came, so we set it up like Santa's like shop. It was like toys by, here's the Star Wars toys. Here's the Barbies. Here's, you know, so the nonprofits would come and they would pick up toys. Um, for all the kids in their care. And ICA works with refugee and foster youth, and they came, and their staff came and spent hours. They have 52 youth, and they knew every youth, like, by their essence, like, what kind of toys they would like personally, intentionally. They weren't just, like, grabbing stuff, and they were, they were intentionally picking things out for hours. And that's just a shot of them doing that. And it was just so, even around that corner is more stuff, stuff for kids, stuff for teens, and it was so cool to see. Um, and then there's a group called Blossom, not Blossom Place, Compassion Planet. We have Blossom Place too, we have a lot of organizations. Compassion Planet, um, they work with aged out foster youth and those kids, um, I, it's so hard. Aging out, it's so heartbreaking. But to be able to be seen specifically and loved intentionally um, really, really impacts the heart and the soul. And if you go to the next picture here, um, this is, these are some of the youth the Lisa, who is on the Compassion team, she said this, we wanted to thank you so much for your generous gifts. It was quite an evening for our young people. Two of them had not had Christmas in three years, and one had never had a Christmas. So there were a lot of feelings of overwhelm and even tears. And there's two more photos there. I love that one. He's like so pumped. And just overwhelmed. The warmth of family and of love and being seen intentionally um, can feel overwhelming when you haven't had it before, right? I think it can feel overwhelming when you have. And then this picture is uh, caregiver baskets. So we did caregiver baskets um, for foster adoptive families because they, when you foster or adopt, um, there's social worker visits, there's occupational therapy visits, and all of these added things that you're just, that most people just don't even know about, right? There's just a lot going on, and trauma in the home, and behaviors, and calls from teachers. Um, so to say, hey, thank you for taking care of our kids because if they're in our community, there are kids, right? So we want to support you. We want to say thank you. And so I, I ran into a woman who received a basket at a church event. I'd never met her before. I was just doing a booth. And she came up in tears. And she said, thank you. We, we got a basket from your, from your place. And she said, I don't know how you got our name. She was connected with one of the um, support groups is how she got the basket. But she was crying as she was speaking. And she said, I, I normally give to these things. Like, I'm not in poverty. I don't know why you chose us, she said, but I didn't realize how much it meant to be seen. She's like, I didn't know I even needed it, but it took me an hour to get my son to school today. And she was in tears, and she was like, thank you for seeing us. Thank you for acknowledging us. And so we just want to say thank you for being a part of this. And there's one more thing. It's a video here. So those toys, because you guys brought an abundance of toys, you guys showed up, like, in spades and brought an abundance this is, it goes very fast, it's like a, yes. Um, this is in South Sacramento. Daughters of Zion is a nonprofit that's been there for 15 years, and they serve at-risk kids and families there. And they joined the alliance right before Difference Makers campaign. 
Um, and they didn't ha they do this every year, this outreach, but they, were, they didn't have enough toys this year. And so we were able to give them a, an abundance of toys for their outreach. And a lot of the kids that came um, were actually new to their outreach. It wasn't like the same kids that come every year. A majority of them had never even connected with them before in South Sacramento. So your toys are making a difference all over the region. And it, it, it really, it's more than a Barbie. It's more than a backpack. It really is. Um, let's see, Russell Moore, that's the next slide. Russell Moore wrote a book called Adopted for Life, and he said this, the protection of, char of children isn't charity. It isn't part of a political program fitting somewhere between tax cuts and gun rights or between carbon emission caps and national service corps. It's spiritual warfare. And I believe that. This is war. Like, this isn't just buying a gift for it. This is saying you're seen, you're known, you're loved. The Father knows you by name, every hair on your head. This is war. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's getting a little dicey out there. <laughs> in the world, it's dark, right? But John 1, 5 says, light shines in darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. And every time the church shows up to be light in darkness and to defend and to, and to defend the least of these, that's making war. So thank you for being a part of that. It's more than a toy. It really is warfare, and we couldn't do it without you. And we really are honored for your partnership. And so today, I want to talk a little bit about living your divine design. Living your divine design. This is something that God's just been ministering to my heart, so I thought I would just bring it and share with you. And so if you have a Bible or your app or whatever device you use these days, we're going to be in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It's also going to be on the screen, so you can just look on the screen. Um, but Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. And if I'm honest, can I be honest here? Yes got a few. If I get at least one, then I'm just going to do it. I just need one person. Um, the verse 10, where it says that we're God's handiwork, to, created in Christ Jesus, like, it's also like we're his workmanship, his masterpiece. Have you guys heard that verse before? Some of you? If you've been around, and maybe some of you, it's your first time hearing it. I grew up in church, and I've been in ministry the last, like, 10 years, um, and I get familiar with verses, and I have to be honest, and then I just stop, I stop hearing them. They become like white noise. You know when they're on coffee cups, and they're on wall hangings, and they're on t-shirts, and you're like, sure, sure, like, masterpiece, I'm his masterpiece, you know, and, and you kind of like dismiss that it is the word of God, it is truth, and I have to remind myself that God's word doesn't return void, and even if I've, even if I've heard it a thousand times, it doesn't make it any less powerful or true. Hebrews 4 says the word of God is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, it penetrates dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. That's the power the Word of God has. It judges the thoughts and attitude of our heart. So with that attitude, and maybe that's just for me, maybe I'm the only one who gets like really used to these verses, and then I just kind of, they just go in one ear and out the other, um, and I hate that, and I have to really readjust my heart and say, God, help me to take you at your word with all the authority and power that your word has. And so Let's pray today, and if you would pray with me, for, for a revelation of the reality of what, what the Word is saying here, what Paul is saying here in Ephesians. Um, so let's pray. Father, uh, God, thank you. Thank you that you are in this place. Jesus, thank you that you're here with us, that um, you desire to speak. We open up our hearts and our minds, and God, I pray that you would, you would speak, that you would um, remind us of the power and authority in your word, that your word would transform our hearts. God, that we would go out differently. Father, I pray every distraction would cease. In the name of Jesus, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, okay, so Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. So Ephesians, a little context. Ephesians the, was written by Paul. Um, he wrote it when he was on house arrest in Rome, so he's basically in jail, right? So he's writing to the church in Ephesus. And he's writing to a church that's mostly Gentile. And this matters because in that time, there was, a, there was a division between the Jews and the Gentiles. And the Jews are like the chosen people, right? And the Gentiles are anybody who's not a Jew. 
So you're like, you're a Jew or you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. But there was a great division. So a Gentile, even if they got saved, they gave their life to Jesus, they still couldn't do the things that Jews did, like go to the places of worship. They were still like this great divide. But Jesus came, and he changed all of that. For those that were called not chosen, he changed all of it. In Ephesians 2, 13 and 14, it says this, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Just like what you were saying in communion, we just took communion. And with that, he destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. So both physically and spiritually speaking. And so if we go back six verses, we see where we land today for our passage 8 through 10. We're going to read it again. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by work, so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So in verse 8, Paul says we're saved by grace. He's saying there's nothing that you can do to earn this. This wasn't about you. You're saved by grace through faith. And by faith, he's saying by simply just putting your trust in Jesus. You put your trust in Jesus, you were saved by grace through faith so that nobody can boast. And then verse 10, that you're God's handiwork. He says we are God's handiwork, and that we includes you and I. And that handiwork, as I said earlier, it's also translated workmanship or masterpiece, which there's this, this essence of there's a unique design to you. Have you noticed in nature there's a unique design to things? Trees, animals, animal kingdoms, like all that. You ever watch the Nature Channel? It's like so fascinating, right? You got a, you got a waiver back here. Yes, yeah, it's like really fascinating, actually. I don't know if I'm just getting old or I'm like, the National Geographic, it's, it's so cool how God made the world. Or like seeing a baby born, seeing how they look like mom, and then all of a sudden they look like dad as they age a little bit, and you just see there's a unique design, and there's a unique design to you, your passions, your temperament, even whether you're introverted or extroverted, the things that give you joy in life, the things that you are naturally gifted at, your strengths and your limits. There's a unique design. And then there's good works prepared in advance for us. What does that mean? Like I can wake up and literally say, I can pray, God, help me just to follow those good works that you have for me today. You have good works prepared in advance for me today. That's a crazy thought. Does that mean I don't have free choice, that these good works are, no, you can, God can, some, not God, he can make you a cake, but somebody can make you a cake, and if you, don't eat it, then they, they can prepare it, but you have to choose, right, to partake of it. So God has prepared good works for each of us in every day, and we get to choose to step into those. So how many of you have heard before that you are God's workmanship or masterpiece? Have you guys heard that before? Okay, so a good portion of you. Now I'm going to ask you this, and you don't have to raise your hand for this one, but how many of you, just think about it, actually, like, at the core of you, at the very core of you, when everything's quiet, you believe it. With all of your heart, you believe there's this unique design crafted in love by the Father, specifically and intentionally, everything about you. You believe it. And I hope that you do. But I think the reality is a lot of us struggle with that. Right? If not now, at some point. Not just hearing the truth, but believing it in a way that it, like our actions reveal our beliefs, right? So how do you know what you believe? What do you do? Not what do you say. Our actions reveal our beliefs. So what do we believe? In my past, I, I, I'd shared here a little bit, but I struggled with addiction to drugs and alcohol for 14 years, and the Lord set me free miraculously. Like, like I'm passionate about prayer because I see how God intersects your life, and it changes everything. Our God heals. He's in the business of healing today, um, but I fell in love with Jesus, and with the same passion, I pursued everything else. I pursued Jesus, and within six months, I'm in this internship at a church, and we were doing a church garage sale, like you guys are doing a church garage sale. Yes, for church garage sales, and um, I was setting up and like doing stuff for the garage sale, and I remember seeing two old co-workers walk up to me, and they had their baby with them. This moment marked me, and uh, they were just talking to me, and I was talking to the wife, and her husband was standing like here, 
And I'll never, never forget, I could see, you know you can see out of the corner of your eye? I could tell, he's looking at me like so weird, like so confused, and he's got his head like kind of cocked. It's like, what is, I'm like, why is he staring at me so awkwardly? And then all of a sudden, we're done talking, maybe 10 minutes later, and he says, you just seem so, you just seem like a different person. It marked me. In my head, I, I knew I was a new creation, but I literally thought when you saw me, you saw, you, like on my forehead, it was just written, I was an addict. I was an alcoholic. My past still remained with me. Like that moment, I realized he does not see what I see. Wow, you see something different than me. I can, that moment, I can't even tell you how much that, I don't even think they realized what that moment did to me. But three months later, I would go, uh, the Lord just put something in my heart. He said, there's a difference between freedom and healing. I've set you free, but you need to pursue healing. And I ended up doing Celebrate Recovery that night. I went to Celebrate Recovery. I did a step study. And I had no desire to drink or use, so I wasn't like trying, you know, I felt like, why am I here? <laughs> like, sometimes you just do things because you're being obedient. You're like, God told me to. So I, I could have done a better job. I think I, half of the time, I was just like, I'm being obedient. I'm here. Um, but I look back, and I see that God was just beginning to unravel something in my life, and that was shame from the past. Like, there was something that I needed freedom from because that can hinder that's one of the things that can prevent us from seeing ourselves as God sees us. It changes our lens, that we can't receive the truth that has been spoken over us, that we are his handiwork, right? Shame can change that lens. It's an attack on identity, and the enemy would love to speak into your identity, but God has already spoken a truth over your identity. See, there's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is, I did something bad, and there's a reason to have guilt, right? When we there's reasons that if I do something bad that I feel guilty, I repent, turn back, you know. Um, but shame is I am bad. It's about our identity. You see, working with foster youth and working with even just like young people in the church, I see this a lot where there's a point of pain in someone's life uh, that could be in my work, working with, you know, with um, kids from hard places, we call that trauma. And trauma is anything that's beyond your ability to cope like any event beyond your ability to cope. And it's not just about what happens to you. Like it could be like the loss of a family member. That could be a divorce. It could be bullying or, or it could be abuse and neglect, um, any of those things. But it's not just what happens to you, but it's what happened in you when that happened to you. Because it registers different for everybody. Two people can be in the same car accident, um, but for one it registers as trauma, for one it doesn't. Why? Because there's different factors going on in their life at that time. A typical, a typical like, example of this is for a child whose parents get divorced. Because um, a lot of kids, when things happen, they, they register as something is wrong with me. Like, a child's parents get divorced, and all of a sudden they say, like, somehow they think it's their fault. Would we ever say that it's a six-year-old's fault? When parents get, we would never say that. But why do a lot of kids internalize that? It's a shame narrative that something's wrong with me. We know it's an absolute lie. But it doesn't feel like that for that child. That's the narrative. So shame can be a result of our own decisions. Like I look back and I see shame from my history of, as a result of a lot of the, just honestly poor decisions that I've made. Um, or it can be a result of like somebody else's sin against you. Like for those kids or kids that have experienced um, neglect or abuse. And, and I would just say if, if if that is you, if that has entered your story in any way that um, was not God's perfect design at all, and I'm sorry, that's not how God designed it to be. A question I've heard before is how, how do I trust God when he was there, when that happened? And I would just say that it is, it is a very valid question and is worth pressing into and worth, worth wrestling with and saying, God, where were you when that happened? God wants to speak into these things. He's not afraid of our questions. There's a greater danger in not asking questions and asking the questions. He's a good father, and he wants to speak. He wants to speak into those questions. We don't have to have all the answers to open our heart to healing. Trauma fractures our lens, and shame can fracture our lens, and God brings healing. God heals. He so desires to bring healing. Psalms 139 is another one that is common 
um, that we see in coffee cups or wall hangings, right? This is a common one, but never, none the less powerful. Psalms 139, 13 and 14 says, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. You created my inmost being. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I believe the reason that we sometimes overemphasize these truths and that we see them so often for conferences and for, they're like, we see them everywhere, coffee mugs and all of the t-shirts, is because we so desire to get it from here to here. There's a longing in us that, man, I hear the truth, but maybe there's something that is hindering me from actually believing it in a way that I live it out in my life with all of me, that all of me believes this with everything in me. And God wants that for you. He wants that for every one of us. In your mother's womb, God delighted in you and had a plan for you. You are his handiwork, his workmanship, his masterpiece, created to do good works. So if shame is hindering you today, there might be somebody here that says, that might be me. Like, maybe shame is hindering me. One, I would say you're not alone. And two, how do you move forward? And I think that, that's different for every one of us. Like, I mean, our, our stories are unique, right? Just like our design is unique. But two things I know is that shame is healed in the presence of God and in the presence of others. This is how shame is healed. One of my favorite verses is Romans 5, 8. He said, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. I love this, and every time I, every time I read this, it hits me in a place that I need it, and is that in my, weak, in my lowest point, like when I was just making the worst decisions, that is when Jesus looked at me and said, for that one, for that one, I will give my life for it's crazy to me that his love for me is the same now, now as I'm not perfect at all, but doing my best to serve him in ministry as it was then. That, like, my finite mind has a hard time wrapping itself around a love that rich and that consistent, that it would love me like that. I teach trauma-informed parenting, and um, Dr. Karen Purvis is the one who came up with this curriculum, and she says this, even in the midst of their worst behaviors, every child should be, a child should be able to look into your eyes and know that they are loved. It's not that we accept every behavior, right? No, and God doesn't either. Like, he disciplines us, and he lovingly corrects us, but there's not a fear of rejection. A child should be able to look into your eyes and know that they are loved. This is how shame is dismantled, both with God and in community with others. That even in my, in my disappointments or in my pain or in that sin that I just can't get out of, right? Like Paul said, like I do the thing I don't want to do. I don't do the thing that I want to do. That, that the Father is looking at you and there's love in his eyes, not condemnation. How do we know that? It says, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. That while we were sinners, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The greatest act of love was displayed for me while I was a sinner. In Mark 5, we see Jesus, Jesus came to reflect the Father, right? He came to show us the nature of the Father in the flesh. And we see him demonstrate this with this woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. And in that culture, when you're bleeding, like you're uh, literally labeled unclean. Nobody can touch you. If they touch you, they have to go wash. You're separated from your community, separated from your family. Like, you are basically like an untouchable, right? You're unclean. So this woman hears that Jesus, Jesus is in town. So she finds him. Verse 24 reads, So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of growing better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I can just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. 
At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around to the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around, uh, crowding around against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking to see who'd done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, she told the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I love that. So there was a physical healing, but I believe there was two kinds of healings there. Imagine, just imagine with me, what kind of shame would this woman have been carrying? She wasn't just like, you know, you're like, I think, I think that, you know, we always think about like way too much about what other people think, right? Like, let's be honest. We're always like, I think they think that about me or I think, you know, but she wasn't just like, I think they think this about me. It was like a fact in that society, that she was unclean. And she was physically separated from all of those that she loved. What would that have done to you? When people saw her coming, they would move away. How would that have felt for her? The shame associated with that, I can't even imagine. But she tells the whole truth, and then what does he call her? He says, daughter. Shame steals identity. But Jesus restores identity there. For this woman, that daughter, that phrase, like it's not just a word, like that, that wraps, wrapped with that is family, belonging, acceptance, daughter. It's so significant. See, God always, God always sees us, right? Like thinking about, like shame entered the scene, right, in Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve hiding, and then they hid, but then they had to come out of hiding, and God always knew where they were, right? He asks, like, where did you go? But he knew, he knew where they were, but they had to come out of hiding in order to see God seeing them. There's a difference between seeing somebody and then seeing somebody seeing you. You know what I mean? Like, when your eyes meet, and I see you seeing me. You had to be, she said the whole truth. She saw Jesus seeing her. So we have to be honest with God about our pain and our struggles. And we also have to be honest with a safe person. Lies only live well in the dark. We can't find healing on our own. Healing on our own is like, it's, a, it's just not, it's not really a thing. It's not how God made us. Like biologically, it's not how he wired us. It's crazy. It's crazy that it's, I love studying, so I like, I like neuroscience. I'm kind of a nerd in that way. Like just recently, like just seeing how trauma impacts the body and biology, and I see God's design in it, and it's so incredible to see how God wired us. People want to separate science and the Bible, but they always, they always interact perfectly because God made us, right? But biologically, like it's in a safe, connected relationship that we find healing, and it takes a lot of courage to show up, though, right? To show up and show who you are to another human being who is also flawed. And maybe not every human being has handled your story with care. We've all been hurt. We all have a history, right? But like Brene Brown studied courage. And uh, she found at the core of courage was vulnerability, which is also a scary word, <laughs> vulnerability. Not something we always want to be because there's a risk in that. But a keystone of shame is isolation. Think about Adam and Eve. When they sinned, they hid, right? Isolation. Think about the woman with a bleeding issue. She was isolated. Isolation is the, is the opposite of healthy community. Presence communicates you're not alone and you're not broken. See, neuroscience shows that how healing happens biologically is whatever is keeping a person in shame, like if that thing is just revealed, if that thing is, if they can share that, whatever that is, and they're not met with rejection, but they're met with acceptance and love. That's how the brain is actually healed and restored. It, James says it this way in James 5.16. It says, confess your sins to one another and you'll be healed. Because the prayer of a righteous person 
is powerful and effective. So it's within community, safe and connected relationships, that we find healing and that we find freedom and that we move out of shame into a true and to a right identity. Both biologically and biblically, safe, connected relationships dismantle shame. The hard thing is, I watched a talk one time on the paradox. It's called the paradox of trauma-informed care, but it was saying that basically, like, when hard things happen, like, in relationships, that the thing that you want to avoid then is relationships, right? But God designed us to heal in relationships. So it's an act of faith, an act of trust in a good father that we would choose the right relationships to be vulnerable with, to trust with, because the enemy would love to separate you from the body and you from the church and you from the things that were literally, that God has designed to bring healing for each one of us. That's the design, and it requires vulnerability and it requires trust, and it requires trust ultimately in God ultimately in God, but in others as well. So the last part is Ephesians 2.10 says that we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us. And I would love to, because I'm, I work at a nonprofit and I'm passionate about foster care, I'd love to just come and be like, so go foster and adopt and do good works and just, just only speak on this verse. Um, because I believe that your unique design is so specific, like God has taken into account the things that give you life, the place that you live, the work that you do. He's taken into account all of you, your personality, um, and he has things that will change this world for the better. But I believe that first, before we start doing things, because I think, I think it's easier to do than to become, right, than to receive sometimes. So before we start doing all these good works, we have to really believe that we are his workmanship, that we are loved by the Father, saved by grace through faith. There's no pressure, right? Because we're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not by works so that nobody can boast. I don't have to contrive this up. I don't have to like come up with some grand thing that I need to do. It's grace through faith. I just have to put my trust in Jesus and take him at his word. Believe what he says. He knows the hairs on your head. He has a good plan for you. Take him at his word. So what does this mean on Monday? On Monday. And I say that because I think sometimes it's like we hear one thing and I struggle with this and then what does it mean? What does it mean tomorrow for you guys? Like my heart and my prayers that this would shift something in our, in our lives moving forward. God is good and he's always wanting to do more. Always more. Um, but I would say, here's some things to apply. Ask God if there's anything hindering you from truly believing that you are his workmanship. Is there, and maybe it's shame. Maybe, it's, maybe he's talking to you about something totally different. But ask him prayerfully, is there anything hindering me from truly believing that I am your workmanship or living out, living out that design in my life? Maybe you believe that, but you haven't yet found those good works. What does he want to speak and the next thing is be radically honest with God about your frustrations and pain. Any places of shame? Radically honest. We're not always great at this. He invites this. Maybe you need to forgive somebody. Or maybe you need to receive forgiveness. Ask somebody for forgiveness. And to be radically honest with a safe person. I say a safe person because there are people that probably can't hold what you have to give them, right? So somebody who loves Jesus and loves you and wants the best for you, not Facebook. <laughs> Facebook is not on your team. <laughs> uh, I know you wouldn't do that, but, uh, but not, and not everybody, right? Not everybody can handle, like, your treasure. And so be radically honest with a safe person. And then the last thing is just meditate on Ephesians 2. If you've never done this, take one passage and read it every day for a week and just say, God, speak to me. God, the word of God does not return void. Read it every day and say, tell me who you are and who I am. Much of our life is just taking the truths that we know and then getting deeper and deeper revelations. Like, I know God loves me, but I know it more today than I did two months ago and two years ago, and I hope next week I know it more. Like, we're always growing in revelation and knowledge, and so God wants to speak. Like, in Romans 12, it says um, that we're transformed by the renewing of our minds, right? That renewing happens when we're in the word of God. And so take, take that Ephesians 2, and I, and I challenge you, get into it. 
you will not be disappointed with the word. Let me pray for us. Father, we just thank you, God. Thank you that your word is true and that it changes our lives, our minds, our hearts. God, we um, just receive the truth that we are your workmanship, that you have good works prepared in advance for every person here. God, I pray right now, God, that you would remove um, any barriers to any person here believing that. You would heal any place of pain, of shame. God, I pray right now your spirit would come in and speak truth. God, that you'd speak truth over the enemy's lies. God, that you would allow people to come into um, deep and connected healing relationships. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Wow. We are a broken people, aren't we? Psalm 147, 3 says, He heals the broken heart and binds up our wounds. I really believe God has spoken to some hearts this morning through Heidi. And as I mentioned earlier, we love to pray for our people. I challenge you, if this is an issue that you're struggling with, let us pray for you. We'll have the prayer team up here. Uh, we'll come forward. Heidi's going to be up here if you want to talk to her more about it. We're going to gather around Heidi and just pray for her and her ministry. But if God's been speaking into your heart this morning, let us pray for you. Don't let this opportunity pass you by because God wants you. He wants your heart, and he wants it this morning. So with that said, let's go ahead and dismiss. Have a great week. Leave your baggage at the, at the back door, folks, okay? Don't take it with you. Tomorrow is the new day, the first day of the rest of your life. It's never too late to become the person God created you to be. God bless. Have a great week.